Hello again, brothers and sisters in Christ, or those that might be seeking to know more about God's Word. My name is Bruce Hatcher, and I'm the preacher and evangelist for the Cordova Church of Christ, and I welcome you back to another study of God's Word. We have been looking each week at different books of the minor prophets, and today our focus is on book the, the seventh book in our series. We are now crossing over the threshold of that halfway mark as we begin to look at book number seven, the book of Micah. Now, there's a lot of good lessons that we can learn uh, from this prophet, even though this book was written some uh, around about 2,700 years ago, uh, and a person might get the idea from a book so so ancient that, well, what could a book like that have uh, of use to a person living in the 21st century? But I think that by the conclusion of this lesson, you'll realize that it really reads like the morning newspaper. It is very applicable, applicable to our day and age. And certainly it was written for a different people at a different time, but the lessons that it contains are easily applicable to our lives. So we're going to con approach this book the same way we've been approaching the other books. We're going to look at a short introduction concerning the book, and then we will notice at the, in the second half some lessons that we can learn uh, from the book itself. And so the book of Micah. First thing we want to think about in our introduction is the penman. Who was it that wrote <clears throat> this book? And the quick answer is Micah. <clears throat> now, Mike, uh, according to verse number one, reading from the King James Version, the word of the Lord which came to Micah the Moorish tite. Well, that's kind of a a difficult word to understand. I, I really like the New King James translation better on that, which says Micah of Morasheth. And that's really what it means. A Morash, Morash tight uh, was the <clears throat> old English way, I guess, of trying to indicate that Micah was from the city of Morasheth. Now, Morasheth was about 25 miles southeast of Jerusalem, near to the city of Gath. In verse number 14, it was called Morsheth Gath, indicating it the fact that it was either a suburb or outpost of Gath. Now, those who are very familiar with Bible geography and Bible history might have already asked them, uh, mentioned to themselves, uh, well, wasn't Gath one of, the, one of the Philistine cities? Indeed, it was. It was one of the five cities of the Philistine lords. Uh, however, during the times of the kings, it was often captured and recaptured and uh, went back and forth from being a territory of Judea to a territory of the Philistines. But apparently, by the, uh, according to 2 Kings 18.8, by the time of Hezekiah, it seems to have been permanently wrested from the hands of the Philistines. And so the point I want to make from this is that Micah was from the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, and so uh, the book, the penman, Micah, from Morasheth, Micah being a member of the southern kingdom of Judah. I do want to say before we move on from this point, I want to, to note that there is a close relationship between Micah and Isaiah. In fact, uh, for several different reasons, first of all, they were contemporary with one another. In other words, they, they spoke around the same time. They um, likely knew one another. They certainly knew of one another. Uh, but not only were they contemporaries, but they were speaking in the same nation to the same general group of people. <clears throat> and they also, uh, furthermore, considering the closeness of the relationship, they were, of course, guided by the, by the same spirit. But this especially is noticeable in the fact that there are a couple places where we read almost verbatim. Uh, the same prophecies, specifically Isaiah chapter 2, verses Two through four, you know that prophecy uh, in the latter days, uh, uh, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and uh, it shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it, etc., etc. That is quoted almost verbatim by Micah, chapter four, verse one through three. In fact, uh, with all their similarities in mind, there's one difference that I want to point out, and that is uh, the difference between the two is most notably the social cast of their specific audiences. While Isaiah was preaching to the rulers 
of the city uh, of Jerusalem. He was rubbing shoulders with kings and rulers and the upper class of society. Micah, on the other hand, was speaking to the common man in the rural areas on the plains in what is called the Shephelah area, area of Palestine. And so moving on from this point now, let's begin to look now at the time period. And I know I bumped a uh, button too many times there, but we'll go ahead and talk about the primary audience as well. <clears throat> the time period, we can go back to verse number one again. We read, In the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Well, history records a, a, a basic time frame that each one of these kings was believed to reign. Jotham, 750 to 731 B.C., Ahaz, 735 to 715, Hezekiah, 729 to 686, and there is some overlap there, and if you notice that, it's due to co-regencies. Sometimes one would be the ruler, while one was, one was serving as a lesser ruler, as a co-regency, and so that explains the overlap of the dates. And so a popular date, because we know the dates of the rules of these kings, we can, some, we can nail down the general time frame of Micah's ministry. And a popular date that's been given is about 735 to 700 B.C. This seems to correlate with the dates of these kings and doesn't present any kind of difficulty whatsoever. And so we'll stick with that as our dating for the book. 735 to 700 B.C., at least that being the date, the period of time in which he ministered. Now this would make him contemporary, as we said, with the prophet Isaiah in the south and perhaps even Joel. And also Hosea, who was prophesying in the north to Israel, and perhaps even contemporary with Amos. The primary audience, again, in verse number one, I want you to realize, notice where he says, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Well, this doesn't mean that his audience was both, uh, per se, but it does indicate that Micah received revelation concerning both the northern and southern kingdoms. However, the internal evidence seems to favor that he would, his primary audience was Judah, the southern kingdom. It seems his ministry was carried out in and around his home city of Moresheth as he addresses several neighboring cities in chapter 1, verses 10 through 15, and, and among them in, includes Gath, Lachish, Bethlehaphra, Marisha, Adullam, and if you look at your Bible map, you might see all of these locations all in the general vicinity of Moresheth. And so it seems that he prophesied in Moresheth and the surrounding areas to, it, to the neighboring cities. There's no implication that he ever personally delivered a message to the north. So then why would he, me, why would he receive revelation concerning the north? Why would he speak of the north? I see, think, feel that it most likely is the case that his predictions concerning the north were a means of reaching those in the south. You see, the, when those things that he prophesied concerning the north being taken into it, being defeated by the Assyrians and taken into captivity, when those people of the southern kingdom saw those things come to pass, they would know that they had a true prophet in their midst, and they would be more inclined to listen to his predictions concerning their fate and heed his words. And indeed, when his prophetic predictions did come to pass, it was a warning that they received and they did repent. And as far as that goes, Micah was able to, unlike many other prophets who never saw anyone repent or any fruits of their labor, uh, Micah was able to witness some change in the lives of his audience. When the north was taken into captivity, there was repentance on behalf of those in Judah, at least for a time, and Micah got to see those fruits of his labor. Now later on, a uh, hundred years later, in fact, Jeremiah was on trial for blasphemy because of the things he predicted concerning the, 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 uh, the temple being destroyed and the people being uh, carried away into Babylonian captivity. Some of the people wanted to put him to death because of those and accused him of blasphemy. And an interesting thing happens. Those who defended Jeremiah actually recalled Micah 
and the things that Micah prophesied, and they use that as a as a means of defending him, a historical precedence that was said, in, 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 per se, uh, in, for example. Let me just read to you from the account of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 26, 16 through 19, which reads, So the princes and all the people said to the priests and prophets, This man does not deserve to die, for he has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. Then certain of the elders of the land rose up and spake to all the assembly of the people, saying, Micah of Moresheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and spoke to all the people of Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed like a field, Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins, and the mountain of the temple like the bare hills of the forest. Did Hezekiah of Judah and all Judah ever put him to death? Did he not fear the Lord and seek the Lord's favor? And the Lord relented concerning the doom which he pronounced against them. But we are all doing great evil against ourselves. And so the point there made, not only did they refer back to the precedent of uh, concerning uh, Micah and how he was treated but they also but they also make note that Hezekiah specifically turned to the Lord as a result of Micah's prophecy. <clears throat> With this in mind, more more I'm going to refer back to this in Jeremiah a little bit later on, but let's move back to our points and notice another point of introduction, the purpose of writing. The main purpose of his writing was is easy to deduce from the from his writing itself to proclaim and predict God's judgment against both Israel and Judah because of their sins. Now, there is a contrast I want to note between Micah and Joel. Remember when we talked about Joel, we noted that Joel did not specifically list any of Judah's sins. But Micah, on the other hand, specifically lists many of them, including idolatry, occultism, villainy, injustice, covetousness, dishonesty, violence, lying, corruption, and he notes that this took place from the top down, from the rulers of the land all the way down to the commoners. Micah also was the first prophet to specifically state that Judah would be carried away captive to Babylon. Chapter 4, verse 10, chapter 1, verse 16. And he was also the first one to threaten them with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Chapter 3, verse 12. Chapter 7, 13. Like many of the other prophetic writings directed to God's people, the condemnation delivered into them is tempered with a future hope. Micah also predicts a restoration and a bright future for a remnant of God's people. <clears throat> now let's notice an outline of the book. <clears throat> this outline homes in on a phrase, hear ye, that appears in three times throughout the book and basically helps to divide the book into three, uh, <clears throat> three sections where God address, uh, addresses a different audience. In the first section, chapters 1 and 2, God addresses all the people. We read the words in verse 2 of chapter 1. Hear ye, or hear all ye people. Then, chapter 3, verse 1, we read, Hear, I pray you, O heads of Jacob. And God summons the leaders then to hear. And then, in chapter 6 and 7, God summons the mountains to hear. We read in chapter 6, verse 2, Hear ye, O mountains. Now, if you might be asking, why is God addressing mountains? Well, this is a figure of speech. In fact, two figures of speech used together. Personification, get, attributing human characteristics to the mountains, ma uh, presenting the, uh, as if the mountains had ears and could hear. And then the other figure of speech is called apostrophe, where the uh, one giving the speech addresses an audience that is not present, it, present as a means of, making, of emphasizing a point. And so these figures of speech are used here as if a courtroom, it's, an, it's as if a courtroom scene is taking place and God has a controversy with his people and so he is calling the mountains and the hills together to form the jury 
as he presents a case against his people. And so now having looked at this introduction of the book, now let's notice the lesson, the second half of our sermon today, the lessons that we can learn from this book. And there's a number of good ones, many more than I've in, decided to include, but I have chose some that I believe are really uh, some good ones for us to think about <clears throat> today. And so lesson number one, lesson number one. The first lesson I want us to talk about is a lesson that can be gained from the prophecies that are fulfilled in the book. Micah, <clears throat> all prophecy is can be we we can talk about prophecy the fact that prophecy is not only for forth telling uh, foretelling but forth telling prophets often talked about things that were happening now and things that were talk happened in the past forth telling but God prophets often predicted things that were yet in the future and so they foretold events as well and Micah foretold many events. And these predictions all came true, and they were very specific too. Not vague generalizations like you might see with Nostradamus or other so-called prophets. Micah gave very specific prophecies, and they all came to pass just as specific as he described them. Let me list some of these for you. First of all, he predicted that the Assyrians would defeat Israel and destroy Samaria. History records that this did, in fact, come to pass. The, his, the Assyrians would come against Judah, but not defeat it, he predicted, chapter 5, verse 6. History confirms this to be true. He predicted that the land of Assyria would be laid waste. History confirms this was true. He predicted the Babylonians would destroy Jerusalem and the temple. History confirms this to be true. And he mentioned this before, but before Babylon even became a superpower. He mentioned this when Assyria was still the world power. And then he mentioned further that the Babylonians would carry Judah into captivity. History confirms this. And then he mentioned that the Jews would later be delivered from captivity. History confirms that to be the case. And then he predicted that God's anointed ruler, who was foretold from ancient times, would be born in the little small town of Bethlehem, chapter 5, verse 2. His secular and biblical re history record that Jesus of, of Nazareth was indeed born in Bethlehem. He predicted that in the latter days, God's house would be established on earth. It would take place in Jerusalem. From Zion, it would come forth. Zion being the Temple Mount. And if you remember from the book of Acts, where was, were they when Peter and the other apostles began to, when the Holy Spirit came upon them and they began to speak in tongues? They were on the Solomon's porch, which was part of the temple complex. They were in the Temple Mount, Zion, just as Micah said it would go forth. He also prophesied that it would be accompanied by a new law the law of Christ, and that all nations would be its citizens. <clears throat> Folks, even though the premillennialists miss it to their own demise and they're still looking for a future kingdom, the Bible confirms, Acts chapter 2, the kingdom came with power and with glory. The Bible confirms that Peter, Paul, John, and many others were part of that eternal kingdom that one day will be translated up to God and there reside in heaven with him forever. Friends, apart from the Bible, you will never find prophecy so specifically uttered or fulfilled with such detail as you find here in Micah and other places in Scripture. Everything Micah said came true. It came true just exactly as he claimed it would. Such knowledge, such foreknowledge is supernatural. No one can prophesy things like that unless they have divine help. Now, what do the critics say about this? Well, they assume it must have been written later. And just and it, it's a lie that these things were written back then. They, they, these things must have been written long after these things came to pass. However, history, we have absolute proof that these things were written 
prophesied and recorded long before these events took place. For example, back to that passage in Jeremiah. We know that by the time the book of Jeremiah was written, over a hundred years later, when those events that took place in Jeremiah's life happened, they referred back to the writings of Micah as already being historical documents. Furthermore, Daniel referred in Daniel chapter 9 verse 2 referred to Jeremiah and his writings as being ancient in Daniel's day. And then the Dead Sea Scrolls have proved have been radiocarbon dated to and uh, and tested and proven to be to date somewhere back to about 200 years before Jesus was born. And they record all these documents and prove that they were accurately preserved and that they were ancient history. And so the question for us is then, how did Micah know all of these events long before they took place? How did he know about Christ hundreds of years before Christ was even born and where he come from and and when the kingdom would be established, etc. Lucky guest? No, absolutely not. Time machine? No. What this proves is that prophecy is real and that Micah was a true prophet. But not only that, it proves that the one who revealed these things to Micah, God in particular, is also real and that he has been intimately involved in the course of humanity. That is the first great lesson that we can learn uh, from this book, and a great one indeed. Now, what else can we learn? Lesson number two, when I consider the book as a whole, when I consider the fact that this is a book about God's judgment being exacted upon the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, I see a lesson about the wages of sin, the results of sin. God was going to make Samaria a heap in a field, chapter 1, verse 6. In other words, it was going to be reduced to ruins. And concerning the south, he said, Zion, the Temple Mount, will for your sake be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem will become heaps, chapter 3, verse 12. Why, were the, why was this going to be the case, chapter 1, verse 5? For the transgression of Jacob is all this, and for the sins of the house of Israel what was coming upon these people was a result of their sins. Micah's message exemplifies Paul's statement to the Romans that the wages of sin are death. Romans chapter 6, verses 20, verse number 23. What does that mean? The wage of sin is death? It means if you go to work for sin, the paycheck you're going to get is death. In the spiritual realm, this is a law of certainty. We call it the law of sin and death. And it is just as certain as the physical laws such as gravity. If you were to climb upon a building and jump off the roof, because of the law of gravity, you will fall. And if you fall far enough, you will die. <clears throat> this is just as true. And what is true concerning the law of gravity is just as true concerning the law of, of sin and death in the spiritual realm. If you sin, your sins will separate you from God. And if you sin continually and you do not repent, those sins will separate you from God eternally. <clears throat> sin brings about death. This principle was set forth in the Old Testament long ago, and when Moses spoke to the people in Deuteronomy chapter 30, 15 through 19, he said, I present before you this day life and good, death and evil. And he goes on to elaborate that if they do what God tells them, God's going to bless them and they're going to have life and prosperity. But if they turn to idolatry, turn away from God, their hearts, then they will receive instead of life and blessing, cursing and death. Again, sin brings forth death. The point was made again when Moses told the Israelites to go over Jordan to drive their enemies out of the land, and if they would do that, they would be blessed by the Lord, but if they wouldn't, make no mistake what, that they would be sinning, and be sure your sin will find you out. Numbers 32, 23. 
The principle set forth in the New Testament. Romans 6.23, Paul said the wage of sin is death. Also Galatians 6, 7, and 8, where Paul told the Galatians, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. There's your death, corruption. Again, James said, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. James chapter 1, 14 and 15. Finally, the apostle John also said the same. Revelation 20 verse 14, John noted that if we die in a, in a state of sin, we will go to that place called the second, or described as the second death. Another lesson that is very closely related to this one is we learn a lesson about the spread of sin. Sin is like a plague. It's contagious. It spreads if it's not treated. The root of sin, Samaria's sin was idolatry. Where did they learn that idolatry? It spread to them from the influence of heathen nations. Nations that they were supposed to drive out of the land, but they did not. And so they allowed them to stay in their midst. Perhaps they rationalized it in their mind and said, well, God's just being overly cautious. We don't have to drive these people out of our land as long as we keep our thumb down on them. As long as we keep them under heel, things will be fine. We'll make them pay taxes. We'll make them be tribute, pay tribute to us, and there won't be any danger. But then their children married and married the children of their children, and they, and they started practicing this idolatry. Then Jeroboam came along, and he was practicing that idolatry. He made it the national religion, and he allowed those roots to grow even deeper. And that sin became a sin on a national level. By the time of Micah's ministry, God concluded that Samaria's wound was incurable. Chapter 1, verse 9. In other words, Samaria's sin sickness was so advanced, she was beyond saving. Her doom was inevitable. But then notice in verse number 9 of chapter 1, he continues, For it is coming to Judah. He is coming to the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. So the contagion of sin had spread from the heathen to Samaria to the Israelites and then to Judah. And finally, it's now even breached into the gates of Jerusalem, the holy city. Friends, sin is a plague. It's more communicable than the coronavirus. It's even more dangerous than the coronavirus because it promises to be fun and there's no mandates to prevent it. Friends, we cannot afford to flirt with sin, or to tolerate it in our midst. And though the world downplays it, makes light of it, and even though it's promoted by the rich and famous and our national leaders, we cannot tolerate sin in our midst. For the wages of sin is death, and, de and sin is a plague. One of the points that I just made brings us to our next lesson from this book. That point being, it is often sin is also promoted by the rich and famous and even our national leaders. Our next lesson is that, that we see in the book of Micah is the consequences of corrupt leadership. You know, Micah didn't give a pass to the common man by any means, but he placed much of the blame of Judah's condition upon the corruption of its rulers. Both the unofficial rulers, or the wealthy upper class, and the official rulers, or the governing officials. Micah addressed them both. In chapters 2, verses 1 through 11, he talked about the wealthy upper, upper class, who were the unofficial rulers of Judah. The wealthy rule, in a sense, even in our nation, because their wealth grants them power over others. They are able to control many others because of their wealth and power. And the wealthy in Judah, they were using that wealth to oppress the poor simply because they had the power to do so. Chapter 2, verse 1. By lawyers in red tape, cunningly devised schemes, hook and crook, they were stealing 
the land, homes, and livelihood of the less fortunate. And they didn't want anyone to speak out against their evil ways, so they commanded the prophets not to prophesy. Chapter 2, verse 6. However, interestingly enough, Micah notes that they would be willing to hear those prophets who prophesied falsehoods or those who appealed to their carnal desires, such as prophesying about wine and strong drink. Chapter 2, verse 11. Side note, there's yet another argument against social and recreational use of alcohol. <clears throat> it's certainly presented in a negative light there. The official rulers are also condemned by Micah. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, he focuses on the governing officials. Kings, royals, nobles, judges, and even the religious leaders. Michael, excuse me, Micah compares them all to cannibals who tore the flesh from the bones of the people, chopped them up, and cooked them in a pot to eat them. What a terrible, terrible illustration there, but an accurate one. The, these people, the rulers of the land, the ones who above all should have understood fairness and justice. After all, it was their job, their reason for existence. And yet they hated what was good. They loved what was evil, according to chapter 3, verse 2. They were crooked and had perverted uh, a perverted sense of justice, chapter 3, verse 9. The judges ruled in favor of those who paid them, chapter, according to chapter 3, verse 11. And then chapter 7, verse 3, a very interesting note, thing that he notes there, and all this reads like the morning newspaper. Society's leaders in Micah's day would get together and they would decide what they wanted to come to pass and then they would weave together a plot so that they could use their collective influences to bring about their heart's desires. The religious leaders were also causing the people to err. Chapter 3 verse 5, the people would come to them seeking guidance and they would only give them guidance, good guidance if they paid them extra, you're gonna have to have a little. Have a, you're gonna have to put a little honey in the pot if you want me to tell you something good. Otherwise, all I've got for you is bad news. Chapter three, verse five. The result of all this corruption from the top trickled downhill and made the entire population of Judah corrupt. Michael laments in chapter seven, verse two, that. The good man is perished out of the earth, and there is none upright among men. In other words, you couldn't hardly find a righteous person anywhere, even among God's own people. No one could be trusted. In chapter 7, verse 6, he elaborates, not your friends, not your family members, not even a person's own husband and wife could be treated, could be trusted during those times. How did things get so terribly bad? It started with the corruption of sin, it started with the leaders and it trickled down all the way to the commoners. And though the commoners aren't rebuked as rough as the, uh, as the rulers of the land, he doesn't make excuses for the commoners. The commoners did not have to follow the rulers in wickedness. Now the point, as we make application right here to our lives, I want to recall what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 1.9. There is nothing new under the sun. People have not changed much at all. The description that Micah gave of the nation of Judah sounds like a description that we could give for America today. The majority of our national leaders on both sides of the aisle are absolutely corrupt. During election time, they hate one another. But then when the election's over, what do they do? They start conspiring together to get what they want. The lawyers conspire to drain the pockets of both sides. <clears throat> the judges rule the way they're paid to rule. The lawmakers make laws according to the payments that they receive from their lobbyists. <clears throat> all this, all this is, is, is certainly... Uh, vexing to the Christian spirit. And oftentimes Christians are singled out by the policies of these corrupt leaders. Christians are hated 
many accusations are brought against Christians and policies attack Christians. Why? Best answer is because we speak out against corruption. And these people want to, want to practice their evil deeds under the cover of darkness. They don't want the light to be shined upon their evil deeds. And why is it that they speak of tolerance when it comes to other religions than Christianity? Other religions that are less moral, less benevolent, and less just, why do they speak of tolerance concerning them? Because it gives them a cloak of righteousness. It gives them a form of godliness. It makes them look like they're righteous people. All the while, in reality, they're practicing corruption and they only pat the back of those who will pat their back. As Christians, we ought to be wise uh, against all these schemes that we see taking place because history is only repeating itself. The Bible has told us about these things time and time again in history, and it should be no surprise to us when we see it in our day. This idea that we have evolved as, as a society and we are well beyond those, uh, those things that, those silly things that we did in the past is absolute nonsense. We see it play out over and over again, and our, our, uh, Naive, uh, our naive, uh, or um, <clears throat> what word am I looking for? Naivety is that the word? Our uh, ability to be naive to these things only helps to pave the way for them to get by with it. You know, as Christians, we should do everything that is within our scriptural and legal ability to do to prevent such wicked people from leading our country. And there's, I understand that we're limited in what we can do. But there are some things that we can do. But, but I do want to put, take this moment to point out an inconsistency that I am, have seen in the lives of many Christians when it comes to this. You know, we should never be guilty of compromising our morals on the grounds of financial gain. That's exactly what Micah was criticizing uh, concerning the nation of Judah. <clears throat> and I'm very concerned in past election cycles when I have seen my brothers and sisters in Christ who will go to the polls and they will vote on who is going to whose policies will help them most financially, whose policies will help our economy best, who promises to give them more kickbacks, who promises to support their agendas that have nothing to do with morals or ethics? <clears throat> and all the while, they will somehow ignore the moral implications the, of the policies that those same people are advocating. Now, I will, do I have to remind us that God never told us that we would be that we as Christians would be financially independent? God never told us that life would be peaches and cream. God never told us that if we would obey his son, Jesus Christ, that uh, the prosperity gospel is not taught in the Bible, that all of a sudden everything's going to be great for us and that we're going to have a big bank account and, and a huge retirement fund, et cetera, et cetera. God never promised us any of that. And God never told us that those are the things that we should strive for the most in this life. But what he did tell us we should do is to let our Christian influence be a light and salt in this world morally. So how can my brothers and sisters in Christ ignore the moral implications, abortion, homosexuality? How can we rationalize it in our mind and say, well, I, now, how do we get past that? and say, I'm going to vote for the guy who helps my pocketbook. How are we any different than the, people, than the, than the rulers in Judah's day, in the day, uh, days of Micah if we do that? We're not any different. Now, I've heard some of the rationalizing arguments my brethren have made. One that comes to mind is, well, we're never going to overturn Roe versus Wade anyway, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know what? We were on a, we were on a pretty good track to overturning 
Roe versus Wade for a while. I guarantee you we'll never do it as long as everybody's thinking about their pocketbook and not focusing on more on the morality, these moral policies that are killing innocent people every day. <clears throat> now, the wealthy, especially wealthy Christians, have a great responsibility in the eye of God to use their influence to po promote morality, justice, and benevolence especially those of us who have great financial means. Paul, writing to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, said, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth unto, unto us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, lying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Use your riches to bring about good and morality in our world. Some of my brethren are doing the exact opposite. They are sacrificing the morality of our, in our world to gain riches. Shame on you. If that's what you're doing, my friends, you need to repent and turn back to God. But in one more point about living under a corrupt leadership, even though in Jeremiah, even though in Micah's day, their leadership was corrupt, that was no excuse for the people to follow their corrupt leadership. Societies can survive even in spite of corrupt leadership. To do so, we must make sure that we don't allow the corruption to trickle down and permeate our lives. We must stand fast and we must pray for those who are corrupt that they may see the error of their ways and repent. Let's move on to, we got just a couple more uh, quick lessons that we can learn from this book. Number five, there's a lesson from the phrase, who is like unto our God? In the very last verses of his prophecy, Micah asked this rhetorical question, uh, to which the obvious answer is, there is no one like unto our God. In particular, Micah challenges his audience to find another as gracious, merciful, and compassionate as Jehovah. Think of all that God put up with from his people in Old Testament times, and the many occasions on which he forgave them. And even when God did punish his people, he never gave them everything they deserved, and he always tempered his judgment with a future blessing and hope. What a God we serve. Compare his justice to the justice systems of our world. There's no contest. Compare him to the gods that man's, man created from their hands and their own imaginations. Again, there's no contest. Our God is even greater than we could even imagine for ourselves. One final lesson for us to consider today I'll end you end our lesson or end our study today with this one. <clears throat> There's a lesson from the phrase, "What doth the Lord require? What doth the Lord require?" This question is asked in chapter six, verse eight, and answered. It is a rhetorical question by nature, <clears throat> meant to emphasize the point: what God does, what do, God does require. If you were to ask this question among people today, if you were to ask 10 different people, you would likely get 10 different answers. Some would say, well, you just need to believe in Jesus Christ. That's all God requires. Others would say, well, you just need to be sincere in your heart when you worship God. That's all that he requires. Others would say, well, you just need to be a good person to treat others with kindness, to be a good citizen. That's all really that God requires. The Israelites could add another idea to that. They had the impression that all God requires really is sacrifices. We just have to sacrifice animals and everything will be okay. Every one of those aforementioned points are absolutely wrong. They're not wrong together. They're wrong separately. God, neither one of those things is all that God requires. God, they were, these things were wrong because God required all of them and more of us. The point that God was making in that day 
when he, uh, let me read what Micah said. Micah told them, He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what the Lord doth require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. They were doing the very opposite of these things. They were unjust, unmerciful, prideful, and unfaithful. What about us today? Do these things still apply to Christians today? Of course they do. God's principles never change. But what we really need to take note of, and what I really want to emphasize here on this point, is this. Lest some people get the impression uh, that this is all that God requires, that things like obedience to God's laws are less of, are of less importance to God, that's making the same mistake that the Israelites made when about sacrifices. Yes, God required sacrifices, but the sacrifices were an ends to a means. He wanted their hearts. And yes, God requires obedience, but, he, but it, it's an ends to a means. He wants our hearts. <clears throat> but God does require, expect us to follow his commands. And furthermore, we really need to notice a difference, uh, notice this difference. In applying this to ourselves, we must realize that this was said to a people who were already in a covenant relationship with God. Under the law of Moses, they were circumcised at eight days old to enter into that covenant with God. Once they were in that covenant, God, yes, he required sacrifices, but what he really wanted was he wanted these people to be humbly, walk humbly with their God, to be just and merciful and loving. Furthermore, in this age, we must enter first into a covenant relationship with God. We must be born again under the new law of Christ. And to be born again, we must obey the truth. Peter said, 1 Peter chapter 1, 22 and 23, Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit and the unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another, with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of incorruptible of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You see, to become to be in the in a covenant relationship with God today, we must come to Him through Jesus Christ, through the Word of the Spirit, through obedience to the plan that Jesus Christ brought. Jesus said that we should repent and be baptized. And by this process, our past sins are forgiven, our minds are renewed, and we become a new creation. We become a child of God. And we will then receive an inher in internal, or we will be recipients of an inher eternal inheritance with God. My friends, I want to close today with the invitation of Jesus Christ. If you have not done this, if you are not in a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ, it really doesn't matter how good of a person you are. I mean, it matters to society. And yes, it matters in, in many senses. But as touching salvation, you cannot be a good enough person to be saved. If that were the case, Jesus Christ wouldn't have had to come and die on the cross. You need to be saved because there's only one remedy for sin, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. And there is only one way for you to come in contact with that blood, and that is through the waters of baptism. For we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we walk in newness of life. It is through baptism that we come in contact with that soul-saving blood of Jesus Christ. Then we can arise to walk in newness of life. Then we can be a new creature. Then we receive an eternal inheritance. Thank you, my friends, for joining us for this study on the book of Micah. I hope it has been profitable for you, and I hope that you can go and likewise tell others about the soul-saving message of Jesus Christ and all these great messages that God has preserved for us throughout the ages in his word that are not outdated and ancient letters that have no bearing on our lives today, but are very applicable, like the morning newspaper. Thank you for joining us today. 
If we can help you in any way, reach out to us and that by the contact information that is about to follow on the screen. And until we meet again, God bless you.